another episode of Going All In, Get the Edge You Need to Succeed. My name is Dr. Erin McKinley, and today I have another awesome spotlight session with Dr. Lacey Peterson from the Distance Dietetic Internship Program at Utah State University. Welcome, Lacey. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. All right. So tell us a little bit about you, your journey to RD, and your journey to Utah State. Well, great. So my name is Lacey Peterson. I am the director at Utah State University, and I have been with the program for almost eight years now. I came in as faculty, and then in 2008, I took over as director of the program. So my background is prior to working at Utah State University, I was a preceptor, and I worked mainly in outpatient diabetes education, weight management, and behavior modification. So I have been a I have been a dietitian for 15 years now, and largely previous to this, all of my practice areas was were in diabetes management. I'm still really active in the diabetes, the diabetes community, and that's really where my passion lies. So I did my dietetics training at the University of Utah, not to be confused with Utah State University. So in Utah, we have the red and the blue. And so my alma mater is the red, but I now cheer for the blue. And so I did a coordinated master's program at the University of Utah, and then I finished my internship program, and I was hired out of my um, one of my last rotations into diabetes management. So a little bit else about me that I think is pertinent to those of you applying to programs. I am a first-generation college attendee and grad. So um, everybody else in my family, some of them graduated from high school and some of them didn't. And so navigating the college system was really new to me. And that's where a lot of my passion lies as a dietetic internship director is I want to help everybody to achieve their goals. And so as we'll talk about um, admission requirements and applications today, you know, some of you are going to be in different levels. Some of you might have a high GPA and not very much work experience. Some of you might have a low GPA and lots of work experience, and some of you might be in between. And so I want to let all of you know that my goal is to help connect people with the correct dietetic internship program, and again, help everybody who wants to be a dietitian to achieve those goals. So here's me, and then this is my team. So this is Nikki and Maria. So we are also a unique team because we cover, our experience covers all areas of dietetics education. Again, mine is mostly clinical with outpatient and a lot of community. Nikki is our inpatient guru. Her background is specifically in inpatient oncology and nutrition support. And then Maria, her background is very diverse. She's had inpatient. She's had community through WIC. She's also been a food service manager. And so we create all of our own curriculum. We have a competency-based curriculum. So we help to help our interns to navigate completing their competencies through assignments and tasks. And we really bring in our areas of expertise. And so not just what's in your textbooks, but also our own life um, experiences and dietetics. We make sure to integrate all of that into our program. So why Utah State University? Well, one, the faculty is a big part of that. So we are absolutely committed to helping you to achieve your goals. And we're going to do everything we can as people are working towards applying to our program, once people are in our program, and then beyond. We are a distance program, and we have over 20 years of experience. So our program started in 1999, and we're the second oldest distance dietetic internship program uh, in the country. So we do distance and we do it really, really well. Our program does offer flexibility. And so different students have different competing things in their life. So some people might be a full-time student and be working, or sometimes people might be a part-time student and working. Um, people have kids, people have parents that they're taking care of. So we want to offer a flexible schedule again to help you to become a registered dietitian while you are completing your dietetic internship. We don't offer different types of tuition, so everybody pays the exact same tuition regardless of where you're living or where you're training. And we'll talk more about tuition in a little bit. Our program also qualifies for federal financial aid. So some of you might be familiar with like FAFSA. So not all dietetic internship programs do qualify, but ours does because you um, graduate with a graduate certificate once completing our program. 
So that leads into we offer graduate credits. Everyone who completes our program, regardless of where you're living, uh, gains 26 graduate credits. And that can be rolled into um, a couple of programs here at Utah State University. We have one program that is a, our, we consider our master's completion. It's the Master's of Dietetic Administration. It's just made for dietitians. And then we also have an online PH, um, MPH program. So those of you who might be more interested in public health, we have that program as well. Both are online and both um, will accept some of the credits. The MDA accepts all of the credits and the MPH accepts some. We also offer mentoring in the program and beyond. So once you graduate, we also provide mentoring with studying for the RD exam, um, creating resumes, cover letters, and applying for that first job. A little bit about our program is that we are a full-time program. That means that we expect interns to be in their rotations somewhere between 36 and 40 hours a week. We take up to 66 interns per year. And then applications are due in February and the match is in April, so we only participate in the spring match. The internship itself is 30 weeks of rotations and our emphasis is in school food service management and child nutrition programs. What this means is that every one of our interns will complete a rotation in a school district focusing on that school food service. But we also provide training in all of the major areas of dietetics. We provide training, 13 weeks of training in clinical, 13 weeks of training in food service, and four weeks of training in community. The goal is that when you graduate from our program, you will be prepared to enter any entry-level dietitian position that you wish. And then, oh, actually, I'm going to back, oh, I'm going to just keep going. And our RD exam pass rate is 95%. So admission requirements. So our admission requirements are a DPD verification statement for those who have already graduated or an intent to complete, which your DPD director will fill out for you as part of your DICUS application. We do require a GPA of 3.0 or above. And so this is not for all of your classes. This is for your DPD prerequisites and your DPD coursework. So if prior to this you were a music major and you took some music classes and then you decided that wasn't for you and maybe you got some bad grades in those classes, we're not looking at those classes. We're looking at the DPD prerequisites like your science classes and in your actual DPD courses. In those courses that I just mentioned, you can't have any Ds or Fs. If you happen to have got a bad grade and you retook the class, great. You're going to end up listing both of those courses in your DICAS application, but only the higher grade is what's going to be um, worked into that GPA. We also require a minimum of 400 hours of dietetic related work or volunteer experience. So these are our minimum requirements. And so if you don't meet these minimum requirements, um, we're not going to look at your application. As far as the work and volunteer experience goes, um, we have a lot of information on our website related to what does this look like. And so we have a form that's called the work and volunteer experience list, and it will list out a lot of the different things that will qualify as part of that 400 hours. Now, there's lots of things that are typical that you would think of, like if you worked in a hospital, you were a diet tech, you were a CNA, you worked in food service, any kind of food service, hospital food service, fast food, College food, or college food service, any type of food service would qualify as part of the hours. What we're looking for is that you have been exposed to different areas of dietetics and you kind of know what it looks like to be a dietitian. But there are also work and volunteer experiences that feel like they're not maybe connected to dietetics, but in our eyes they are. So we're looking that you have gained skills that will help you to be a better dietitian. So for example, I had somebody who worked in banking for five years but they were in a management position. So they did hiring, they did schedules, they you know, worked with employees on HR topics. These are all things that are related to dietetics and those are topics that are also on the RD exam. So we're gonna connect those. So we recommend to you that you list all of your experiences in DICUS and then you connect those to how would they make you a better dietitian? How do they relate to dietetics? All programs are really looking for some level of work and volunteer experience. Some programs require it, some programs don't, but they all like to see it. So it's better for you to include that into your, um, in your application. So our application timeline is just like very similar to everybody else's. The application is due February 15th. With that being said, this date is a Monday and it's also a holiday. So Monday, DICUS is closed. 
Sunday, Dicus is closed. Saturday, Dicus is closed. We definitely recommend that you submit your application at Friday at the very, very latest because sometimes people have issues with Dicus. And if you submit it when they're closed, you're not going to be able to get the con- con- customer support that you want. So my recommendation is to support, submit that early. So as part of our application, we have the, the Dicus application, DD, um, digital registration. And then we also have an application fee that's outlined on our website. And then we have a supplemental application that you're going to email us ahead of, or as part of that application. And that includes your rotation summary form and your preceptor paperwork. And we'll talk more about finding preceptors shortly. Our phone interviews are going to happen between February 19th and March 19th. So some point of time in there, people who have complete applications, we reach out to them and we're going to invite them for a phone interview and we're going to ask them questions. Um, largely, this is just about getting to know somebody, hearing how they might answer a question. And also, we really try to have like a holistic application process, meaning we don't just look at one thing. We look at GPA. We look at your references. We look at your work and volunteer experience. We we also want to look at um, your personal statement and a phone interview. So we take all of those pieces of the application and we um, give a score to all of those things. And then we give a number, a specific score to each individual, and then we rank them. So phone, inter- phone interviews are a part of that. We're not necessarily grilling you on clinical topics. We're just wanting to get to know you and hear how you answer questions. And then the match appointment day is Monday, April 5th slash 6th. This is a little bit different than usual because typically the match day is on a Sunday and appointment day is on Monday. But this year the match day is on Monday and the appointment day is Monday and Tuesday. So just to let everyone be aware of that. So one of the big things with distance programs is that you do have to find your own preceptors. But I like to address this more as choosing your own adventure. I did a more traditional program, and when it went to completing my internship rotations, they handed me a schedule and said, this is what you're going to do. It was easy, but when I looked at those rotations, there were some things that I definitely was not interested in. And so when you get to find your own preceptors, you really do get to choose rotations that you're more interested in. And we really help you to kind of weave in some of the things that you would like to do maybe as a dietitian later on. And so people are interested in eating disorders, sports dietetics, um, different ideas such as that. We can help them to weave those rotations into their standardized schedule. So we want people to pick rotations or pick people that they really are interested in working with. My first recommendation, though, is to start early. And what I mean by starting early is like starting now or next week. Um, Start looking at places that you can contact, looking at your network, preceptors that you've worked or volunteered with. Start contacting people regarding um, who could be your potential preceptor. We're going to talk about what those rotations look like here in a minute. But we want I really recommend that people create an Excel spreadsheet and start outlining the, the people that they can contact or the facilities that they can contact. Keep track of that. Keep track of who you talk to, when you reach out, and when you can follow up. As far as clinical rotations go, I really recommend that you just call hospitals and ask for the clinical nutrition manager. Every hospital has one. They're going to transfer you somewhere, and it's a really good place to start. So we also have state databases available. We have state databases for every state in the nation, and we're welcome to share those with you. That doesn't mean that those preceptors are going to work with you, but again, it gives you a good place to start. Sometimes these preceptors, depending on where they're located, sometimes they can be over-contacted. So I do recommend that in addition to those state databases, that you also will reach, utilize Google or your network to reach out farther and kind of cast that net a little bit wider so you ensure that you find the people that you want to work with. The one thing I can say is every time I've worked with an applicant who really wants to find preceptors, we've been able to do it. Sometimes we have to think out of, you know, the box and a little bit out of someone's comfort zone, but there's lots of preceptors out there who are willing to work with interns. So if you want a state database, send me an email with your name, your school, and what state you're looking for, and we'll send that your way. There are also lots of other suggestions on our website about finding preceptors. The other thing that's on our website is a, like a sample um, narrative, like what you can kind of write down as you start contacting preceptors. I definitely recommend that you have a script to work with because as you start calling people, 
you get nervous and that's normal. And so sometimes you don't remember what you want to say or what you want to ask. And so I definitely recommend writing out a script. And the first couple of times you use it, you'll be a little bit nervous. But then as you make additional phone calls, you'll get very comfortable with what you're saying. And it will get easier to start reaching out to those preceptors. So we also have a facilities preceptor option list. So what this is going to do is it's going to outline who you want to contact for your preceptors. So one question I get often is, does every single one of my preceptors have to be an RD? Not necessarily. Your clinical preceptors are going to be registered dietitians, but sometimes your food service preceptors are dietitians. Sometimes they're the director of a school district that have 20 years of experience, but they don't, they don't happen to be an RD and that's okay. In communities, sometimes they're RDs. Sometimes they might have a, an MPH. Sometimes they're even nurses. And so that's okay as well. We're looking for specific sp facilities. Um, so sometimes they're RDs and sometimes they're not. When you're looking for preceptors, again, I, we do recommend that you think out of the box. You think about, like, where is your geographic location? Um, and avoid creating false limitations. And what this means is, where do you live right now? Where do you want to live for your internship? And do you have any flexibility in that? Some places are more impacted than others. And so some places it's harder to find preceptors. And some places it's actually relatively easy to find preceptors. Rural areas tend to be easier to find preceptors than more like metropolitan areas. Places that don't have DPD or internship programs right there locally Places that don't have those programs tend to be easier to find preceptors because a lot of times if there's an internship program right there, that program is utilizing those um, facilities. So again, don't create false limitations. Don't think you have to stay right here in this very small geographic lo location. Sometimes you do. If you have, you know, a couple of, if you have a couple of kids and you need to stay close to home, that makes sense. But sometimes people think that they can't go farther um, than what they're used to. And that is what we're talking about as far as a false limitation goes. We definitely recommend a network, network, network. So you might already have a small network, people that you have volunteered with, um, maybe family members that are healthcare providers, um, people that you've met with in the community. The other thing you can do is just reaching out to people. So we're talking about reaching out as far as preceptors go, but also just reaching out to dietitians. If you know that there's an area of dietetics that you're interested in working with, maybe contact a dietitian and ask them if you could take them to coffee or have a Zoom meeting with them so you can learn a little bit more about what their job looks like and learn about how they got to that spot in their career. When you are reaching out to people, I definitely recommend using multiple communication methods. So phone is kind of my number one go-to. It is hard to ignore a phone call or ignore an email and not that people or sorry, ignore a phone call or a voicemail and not that people want to necessarily ignore an email, but sometimes people are just inundated with emails. I probably get 50 to 100 emails a day. I try to get through all of those every single day, but sometimes you miss things and sometimes you kind of have to prioritize one thing over another. And sometimes those intern emails get put on the back burner. So one, use phone if you can. Two, follow up with email, but also just follow up in general. If you reach out to somebody you haven't heard back for a couple of weeks, reach out to them again. And remember, as you're looking for preceptors, don't be afraid because you literally have nothing to lose. I think sometimes people initially are afraid to reach out to people, but if you find preceptors, great. You can apply to distance programs because you have those preceptors in place. Um, and if the preceptor says no, it's okay, nothing lost. If the preceptor says yes, great. If the preceptor says maybe, then you can ask more questions, and that's where I would contact them and ask them when you could follow up again or, or where the maybe is coming from. Maybe I could take you. Um, you know, what is the limitation for saying yes? Is it COVID? Is it something else? Do they need to talk to somebody else? Um, offer to provide your contact information, a copy of your resume, and ask them when you can follow up again. Also, preceptors might have questions for you. So be knowledgeable about the programs in which you plan to apply. Mention the program by name. So if you're going to apply to my program, when you're contacting preceptors, say, I'm applying to Utah State University. It's very often that they have had a history with certain programs, and they're going to know more about that program if you mention it by name. Be prepared to answer questions or follow up with the preceptors if they have questions that you can't answer at a time. So they, they're going to want to know about what you need to do in your internship, how long the rotation is, and when you want to start the rotation. 
if you can't find the answers to one of those questions, you're more than welcome to reach out to me. So if you're emailing back with a pre emailing back and forth with a preceptor, you're like, I don't know the answer to this question. Great. Forward that question to me. I'll help you navigate that question and I can, you can send it back to the preceptor. If they have a question about a affiliation agreement or a contract, all of those questions need to come to me because that's not something that you can complete for them. That's something that we have to do for, as part of the university. So when they're asking you questions about rotations, this is kind of a quick overview. Again, there's more information on our website. Typically, our clinical rotation includes inpatient, long-term care, and outpatient. Inpatient is eight weeks, long-term care is two weeks, and outpatient is three weeks. And on our facility preceptor list, it's going to talk about like what types of preceptors qualify for these different rotations. Food service management is 13 weeks, so this is always completed in a school district. And then community is four weeks. We always require at least one week of WIC, but you can do all four weeks at WIC if you would, if you're interested in that. And so people ask, how many preceptors do I need? Well, some facility, some clinical facilities can complete inpatient, outpatient, and long-term care. So you might need one clinical preceptor. In other cases, you might need three clinical preceptors. You typically only need one food service management preceptor. If you want to do four weeks in WIC, you need one community preceptor. If you want to do two weeks in WIC and two weeks at the food bank, you would need two community preceptors. So it kind of just depends, again, on you creating your own adventure. What do you want your internship to look like? And you can make it look just like that. Changes due to COVID. So what is going on with COVID? As far as our internship goes, we were largely impacted in March. But as we've started our new cohort in August, things have been going really, really well. All of our interns have been able to start rotations. Sometimes their original plans have changed a little bit, like we've adjusted their schedule slightly, but everybody is in rotations. Most of our rotations are face-to-face, -face, but we do have a few rotations that have been virtual, mostly or community rotations. We don't allow for clinical rotations. We feel like clinical skills need to be developed like in clinical facilities. And some of our rotations have like virtual components. So maybe they spend one day at home working on different projects, but the other times they're like in their facility. So we're kind of doing like a hybrid option, but the majority of our interns are in rotations 40 hours a week. We've been really lucky because as some facilities have been impacted, because we're a distance program, we can train in all 50 states and U.S. territories. And so when we know there was a facility that was not going to open, like I have one in Southern California, they just haven't opened interns yet, we were able to move all of those interns to other facilities so they could still get started. So that is one of the nice things right now about distance programs and COVID. We don't just use 12 different facilities, and if they don't open, we're stuck. We have the whole entire country kind of at our disposal, and so everybody has been able to move forward on a very similar timeline as they expected in the beginning. So other things happen with COVID, though. Students get COVID. Preceptors get COVID. Um, sometimes students get sick, and they don't have COVID, but they don't go to rotations because they have to get tested to ensure that they're not taking COVID into the rotations. With that, we are just working with the intern. So we have learned to be extra flexible. We've always been flexible, but now we're, we're just really going with the flow now. And so as things kind of come our way, we just work with our interns to make the best of the situation. If people have to stay home for a couple of days, we work on projects at home. We go back into the facilities. Um, it's been working out really, really well for us. And like I said, all of our interns, all 60 interns we have this year have been able to get started without any significant delays. We also have like a full regular curriculum and we wrote a full COVID curriculum. So as facilities maybe open and close a little bit, we actually have a plan A, B, C, and D to make sure that our interns are still able to complete their competencies, gain their sp skills, and then move forward towards the RD exam. So a couple other things. We do host a in-person 
orientation every June, except for this year, last year, things were a little bit crazy. But we're hoping next year it goes back to normal and that we'll be hosting an orientation in June. It's four days. It's in Salt Lake City, Utah. And it gives students the opportunity to meet faculty, learn about program requirements and expectations, and then starting their nationwide network as they're meeting interns from all over the country. So this year we have interns in 27 different states in the U.S. What are our program costs? So our program costs, um, like I mentioned before, all interns pay the exact same amount, regardless of how long their rotations are or where they're located in the United States. So everybody pays $12,532 for this next year. So that would be the year that you would be applying. There are some additional nominal fees with background checks, immunizations. Some rotations have additional requirements like fingerprinting. We also offer 10 $2,000 scholarships for USU dietetic interns, and people apply for those after the match. And again, they are um, eligible for federal financial aid. The other thing I always try to tell um, like incoming applicants is to always apply to the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics scholarships that open every February. It's a great opportunity for students to get some additional support and money potentially through all of those scholarships. So kind of put that on your list as well. So February, the A&D Foundation scholarships open up. As far as like what all of our money is really based on tuition on the 26 graduate credits that everybody um, accumulates as part of the program. And even if you're coming in with a master's degree, you would still complete those 26 graduate credits. There's no necessarily extra coursework. Everything's integrated into the dietetic internship program. So what happens if you choose to wait or you don't get matched? My recommendations as a DI director are look for opportunities to get more dietetics experience. Where are you working right now? Are you in a dietetics related um, position? If not, could you get a dietetics related position? Um, like I said, either work or volunteer for other organizations, diversify your dietetics experience. If you have lots of experience in food service, can you get some community or clinical experience or vice versa? Also, I recommend keep studying nutrition topics. My clinical textbook is never far from me um, 15 years later. I use this all the time, and you'll find that your textbooks are really useful in the dietetic internship program. So if you have them, I wouldn't recommend selling them back. If you're not going to apply to a dietetic internship this year or you don't get matched, keep studying those. They're really important to pass the RD exam. Also on my website, there's a video that I made about what makes USU DI different. I talk similar about these topics, but it kind of just goes into things a little bit deeper and other things that I found that applicants want to know. If you decide that you want to apply to my program, I have a video that I created that is specifically applying to the USU DI. We break everything down in six steps, and I walk you through all six steps throughout this video, everything you need to know, where you can find it on our website. Our website is laid out pretty well. You can just go to prospective interns and you can see steps one through six. Of course, if you have any questions about this, you're always welcome to reach out to us as well. This is my contact information, our website, my email address. This is my office number, but since I'm working at home, it's transferring to my cell phone. So if you call that number, you'll end up getting me. And then also you can follow us on social media. We're going to be posting um, tips on how to locate preceptors, application tips in general. So if you find those helpful, you can definitely follow um, us there. And now I'm going to open it up for questions. Awesome. That was so good. Thank you for sharing that presentation with us. So I have five questions that I ask every director that comes on a spotlight session. And these questions were put together with the help of some of my students, uh, really taking into consideration what they really want to know uh, from program directors. So the first question is, what is, is there something in particular that you really just love to see when you're reading a personal statement? I think the thing that I really love to see is I think everybody has a story and I really like when that comes out in the personal statement, especially when it connects to like why they want to be a dietitian. I often find in the personal statements, although it's one of their like required questions, it's, it's like, in, sometimes it's implied, but it's not actually covered. So I do like to see when that's actually like specifically addressed, like why do you want to be a dietitian? And then what are your experiences that you've had that have led you down this path. And it is really fun to really read stories. I think we share information that's in story format and it engages people more. I typically read about 80 personal statements a year. So the more I can learn about you through that personal statement, um, I think the more enjoyable it is and also the more memorable it is. 
All right. So our, my next question is a true or false question. And either way, please explain your answer. So true or false, an applicant's resume should always be one page and one page only. 100% false. That would be my answer. What I, I love this. This is the great question. This was just on the end up thing the other day and I posted about it. This week's hot topic. <laughs> yes. This is great. Um, I am very much against a one page resume. I think that this is a result of historically, and I was in the career field when this was going on, when we had to fax in documents such as a resume and we wanted to keep them minimal. Well, we are long past faxing in resumes. And now that everything is electronic, I really don't think that we should limit that. And so as people create their resumes, this is kind of like the first thing that we review. And it really helps us to understand people's knowledge, skills, and abilities. By limiting to one page, I think what we do is we end up limiting the details. And then we kind of have like a really brief overview, but nobody can really go into anything in detail. Also, they start omitting things. So they think, well, maybe this isn't that important, and so they leave it off. So if they have more, you know, volunteer experience at a hospital, maybe they worked in food service for six years, but they think that food service is inferior to clinical dietetics, and then they, like, take that part off. I want to see everything. I want to see everything that you did because I think it plays a role in, again, who you are and what your story is. And I want to see, like, what you learned from that job. What did you accomplish in that job? And I think if we limit it to one page, we start removing the really good information. That's awesome. I 100% agree with you on that one. <laughs> yeah, like, I could talk about that topic forever. <laughs> that is usually the student's number one stress is when they know a director won't want a two-page resume, but then they have other programs that said, like, just like you say, they're like, we want to see everything. And they have this, like, internal struggle of, like, well, if I put the two-page on there and that one school I really like doesn't like it, is that going to go against me? And it's, like, the unknown. We don't know. Well, let me add this. To be honest, in the DICUS application, I don't care what your resume looks like. I really don't. What The only thing I actually use your resume for in the DICUS application is I glance at it, and I look and say, is this visually appealing or is this not? But it still does not even apply. Like that is not any part of the application process. After the match, I make a note of it. And after the match, if you become my student, I look at that note. And if I didn't think your resume was visually appealing, I will work with you to mentor you to create a better resume. That is the only thing I use the resume for in DICUS. So I don't care if it's one page or two pages. But your work and volunteer experience that I rate and I look for the 400 hours, it has to be in the work and volunteer experience section on DICUS. So if it's on the resume but it's not in the work and volunteer experience, I can't utilize those hours. So make sure that you're actually putting that in the DICUS section. But as far as your resume goes, one page, two page, I don't have any preference there. As far as entering your career, I have a really strong preference. And if I don't like your resume, then I'm going to help you create a better resume by the time you graduate from my program. Well, trust that the resumes that come out of this program will be good. Awesome. <laughs> we stress the visual appeal of them. That is good because that is an important <laughs> skill. All right. So question three, what is one thing that an applicant may do? And this could be they could do something in their application, in the phone interview, maybe in an open house, or if you actually meet them in person. What is some one thing that they'll do that could, that's like a total deal breaker for you, like a red flag, like this may not be the best applicant for our program? Oh, that's a great question. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is when somebody, like, starts sending me questions, but they did no research on their own. So they didn't look at the website. So now I went through like some of the highlights of our, of our, you know, information. And, but our, our website is so detailed. Pretty much everything you would ever need to know is on the website. So, it, but it doesn't mean I don't want you to contact me because I'm more than welcome people to contact me. But don't ask me something like, what is your, you know, what is your basic criteria for your program? 
It's on the front page. Like that's a wasted question in my eyes. And so one of our mottos is, our, we have two models for our program. One, read all the things. There's a lot of information you need to know, but as a distance, like dietetic internship, intern, you really have to read the information. We provide the information, read the information. So read all the things. Two is, um, and I just blanked, um, growth, has, growth happens outside your comfort zone. So that definitely happens like into the internship, but beforehand, get into our website, look around. If you have questions, you know, applying to distance programs can sometimes be a little bit confusing, and we get that because they're all a little bit different. So then I welcome the questions, but if it's a very basic question, like, do I have to find preceptors ahead of time? Yes. Yes, you do, because one of the steps in our process is finding preceptors. So that's kind of what I would say about that. Um other than that, I don't have a ton of deal breakers because I realize that this process is difficult and sometimes arduous. And so as like I mentioned, like as a first time, like first generation college attendee and grad, I had to figure out a lot of things on my own and it was difficult. So I really do support helping people kind of navigate the process, whether you end up being a USU DI intern or not. Again, I just want to help people to achieve their goals. So I don't really have a lot of like nitpicky things like, oh, if somebody does this, like I'm just not even going to look at them. No, that's not necessarily me at all, but definitely read the website. That is good advice because I tell my students that this process is really the first test. If you can make it through the process, apply successfully, you're already like doing good in the eyes of these (laughs) directors. 100%. Like literally people are like, the application process should be easier. And I'm like, yeah, probably. But it's actually like the first step. If you, if you can't make it through the application process, you probably can't make it through the internship. And so yeah, this is, this is one of the tests. One of the really definitive criteria of being matched to our program is the application. All right. So. Fourth question on my list. So what is one area of the program that you're actively working on to make even better for your interns? Mm, So many things. Because we actually, um, I'm not sure, my faculty will probably roll their eyes because I love change. People are like, no, it's fine, let's let's not change it. I'm like, let's change everything all the time. So every year we continuously revamp our entire curriculum drives everybody crazy, but I love it because I'm always pulling in new information, what's changing in the profession to make sure that we're hitting like all of the major topics that interns need to hit. The other thing that we, one of the things that we're definitely actively working on right now is I'm pretty involved in writing and reviewing questions for the RD exam. So right now we just, they just released like the update to the percentages for the RD exam for 2022. So I was on the committee that did that. And so the RD exam is like a huge passion of mine. So we actually have five practice exams that I have written that are integrated into our program because we want to be able to provide not only the supervised practice component, but also continual exposure to RD exam practice questions. So then when they get to the actual exam, they're kind of used to answering these things. So there's there's a pre-internship practice exam, there's a practice exam in clinical community and food service, and there's an exit practice exam. And then right now, this year, who knows what we'll be doing next year, but this year we actually send, we write an exam question like every week, and we have weekly reports with our interns. So every week we send them a question, and then as part of their weekly report, they answer the question and justify it, And then we kind of talk about that back and forth. So we're definitely like working on like exam prep in addition to that supervised practice because some things feel like they coincide with the exam, but largely some things feel like they're completely disconnected. So we're always trying to provide like pull in exam components the whole time. Awesome. And that's probably a very much like a a unique thing about our program. You definitely are probably not going to see that in any other distance program, but I'd say programs in general probably don't do that. No, that's awesome. All right. The last of my top five questions, <clears throat> it's actually a two-parter. So the first part is, what would be your three best adjectives or descriptors to describe your program? Mm. I would say supportive, flexible, and 
whether this is good or bad, rigorous. All right. So the second part of that is pretty similar. What three adjectives or descriptors describe your ideal applicants? Mm. Flexible. <laughs> flexible programs like flexible interns because, you know, we all have expectations of, like, what the internship is going to look like. And the internship never looks like that. So not because it's, like, better or worse. You just don't know what an internship is going to look like until you're actually in an internship. So I always talk to students. It's important to be flexible. And in the time of COVID, I think flexibility is even more important. Um, I would also say that organize is an important quality of our program because, or for our interns to have to be organized. And that's largely because, in a sense, it is to create your own adventure. Everybody's on a different timeline. I like to share this. This is an example of my students' schedules. So pink is clinical, green is food service, and orange is community. Everybody is doing their own thing all the time. I keep track of it, and we talk about it every week, but I don't have a lot of due dates for my assignments. I let my students set their due dates because they're knowing what's going on in their rotations. So it's important for them to be organized to be successful with that. Now, I just really ask people, when as people come into our program, tell me, are you organized? Like, and if they say, well, kind of, and I'm like, well, let's make a plan to work on your organization. So the goal is if they either come and organize, great. If not, when they leave, they're going to be organized and they're gonna gain that skill while they're here. So I definitely said that, that is an important attribute. For the third attribute, I would probably say, I'd probably say kind. Because honestly, I think empathy is a huge important, is a huge part of dietetics. And so whether you're in clinical community or food service, I think that empathy is really, really important because we've never walked in those people's shoes. And so whether that's somebody in a hospital bed, somebody that's sitting in front of you in an outpatient center, somebody that you're connecting to resources in a community facility, or literally Food service workers that you're supervising, we all, again, have our own stories. And I think that we have, like, our own strengths and weaknesses. And it's important for us to identify that somebody else that we're working with has different strengths and weaknesses than our own. And so if we can be empathetic to them and kind to them, it's a better experience for us. It's a better experience for them. And I think it really leads to success in your overall career. Nice. I like those. I think you're the first to, to mention the empathy aspect of it, which I, is extremely important. I just sometimes think that people don't think about that. And as I worked in outpatient diabetes management for literally 13 years, you have to learn empathy because it's really easy to say, do this, do this, do this. But what's going on in the rest of their lives outside of that 30 or 45 minutes? And so with all the people that we interact with, whether we're driving down the street or we're in the workplace, we don't know what's going on with them. And I think if we can have an empathetic heart, um, we're just going to be happier people in general. All right. So today's podcast is a little different. We don't have a live audience due to Hurricane Delta making its way towards Louisiana. So I've come up with some background questions so we can get some more information for you. So with the COVID changes, did you reduce the number of hours at all? Or did you just kind of work with the interns to try to get as much of their hours done as possible? That's a great question. I did not like flatline down to a thousand hours. Um, and that's largely because uh, my students complete all of their rotations at different timelines. So the most important thing to me is that when they graduate, they have one completed the competencies and they actually have the knowledge, skills, and abilities to become an entry-level dietitian. So all of the people who kind of got um, the students that kind of got hit hard by COVID who are in rotations in March, April, and May, I really worked with them one-on-one -on -one to determine like, what that was going to look like for them. I focused more on competencies and really focusing on like getting those skills in place. And as long as they were above a thousand hours, then we we're like, okay, but we didn't have like this cutoff, like you did a thousand hours. Okay. You're out. And I know some programs did and, and that's their thing, but I just really, for me, it was like an ethical dilemma of 
my students paid for this experience. They expect to get this experience throughout their internship. So we really worked. And we were working like literally 60 hours a week in March, April, and May. So we stepped in as preceptors. And we started precepting all of our students in all of their different rotations when their preceptors couldn't. And so, again, we didn't – we really individualized everything as far as those hours go. The same thing's going to happen this year as well. Like, we have that set standard of 1,200 hours, but, again, we're going to see how things progress. I want students to get every single experience that they can. Um, if things happen and we have to cut the hours a little bit, then we'll cut the hours. But then if everything is really smooth sailing for them, then I'm going to expect them to get the 1,200 hours from their internship. Okay. So with the the food service rotation, are they completing those 13 weeks like straight in a row, the same place for, for the three months? Yes. Yeah, so there's lots of different aspects to that, though. So one of the goals of like the program is that when people when people exit this, pro, when they exit this internship, they could step into any position that they wanted. And so a lot of times when people are graduating from internships, they don't feel comfortable stepping into food service management roles. And I see like all these memes online about, you know, as soon as the RD exam is over, we forget about all the food service stuff. But, and although I'm a clinician by training and I love clinical dietetics, I've learned to love food service because it provides a lot of great opportunities for interns. Some interns don't like clinical and food service jobs tend to pay really, really well, especially school food service jobs. And so with that, there's a lot of components to that, that school food service position. So part of it is like um, procurement, production. So like making the school, making the food, distributing the food, menu development. So making the menus and your school district could have five schools. Some school districts have 150 schools. And so you get to do all the menu development. You get to do the procurement where people are coming in and you're taste testing foods and then you're taste testing foods with students and so you're doing promotion events. So there's this child nutrition education piece. You're teaching in the classroom. You're, like I said, you're doing promotion events. You're interacting with the students to kind of get their perspective on school, school lunch. And then there's a management component as well, where we have you do a management project, kind of like clinical staff relief, but we have you do that in food service as well. Some people are literally taking over like, uh, like, a school and they're standing in as like the child nutrition supervisor for a week or two weeks at a school. So we allow, so they get this management experience. Typically they're sitting in on interviews and hiring people. They're doing management reports. They're kind of going through like the profit and loss statements. So they're really learning like every single aspect of school food service. So with that, if they were really interested in food service, they could literally step into a management or a director role upon completion from our program. Or they can step into a clinical role or a community role. But that's really like our focus for food service management is we want people to feel comfortable to just step right into those roles. Have you seen graduates from the program move into those types of positions? Like what are the common types of positions that you're seeing lately from program graduates? I mean, definitely because, like, while I've, since I've been here, I've had 500 graduates. (laughs) So definitely all areas of dietetics. But I would say, like, you know, there are certain areas where we have more interns than others. Like, we have a lot of interns in Utah because we're located in Utah. We also have a lot of interns in Southern California, specifically San Diego, because there's a lot of DPD graduates there, and there's, like, 16 internship spots locally. So we have a huge presence in San Diego. I would say half of the school food service directors in San Diego graduated from my program. Nice. And I'd say probably a third of the the program directors in Utah graduated from my program. And then they're like sprinkled all over the place. I have a couple in Philadelphia I'm, that I'm just kind of thinking off the top of my head. You know, there are definitely people all over the place who have really stepped right into either child nutrition manager or director positions right out of school. And now we're talking about they're stepping into positions that are seventy-five, ninety, $120,000 a year, which are really great positions for them. Now, of course, I would still say that probably 40% of our graduates go into clinical dietetics. So that's very, very common. They're going into inpatient positions. They're going into long-term care. Lots of people go into outpatient. They really like that counseling and, and connecting with 
you know, patients on like a longer term longer term basis. So we have all of that. I definitely have people in private practice. So I have people who are in communications. Um, if for people who follow social media, I have kind of a couple of people who are like really like hot in social media. One is like Liddy Rothschild. So she is like all over social media. She's a dietitian coach now. And she really touts like starting your own private practice and having side hustles. So she's a graduate of our program. Um, we, like I said, we have people who work in like dietetics slash communications. Um, they're doing those types of things. And I have people who are working at community based organizations, food banks, WIC. Um, I've had somebody who worked for a, as a dietitian at Disneyland, kind of everything across the board. That's awesome. It's nice to hear the variety. I like that. All right. Talking about some application stuff. So do you not look at cumulative GPA at all? Do you just kind of pretend it's not there? Yep. That's because I mean, I think that's, that's like the, the softy in me, to be honest. Like sometimes we get off on the wrong foot. It just happens. And so if there's other courses that you didn't do great in, if you didn't do great in your American history class, to be honest, I don't, I don't care. I don't think that that's really going to translate to whether or not you're going to be a good dietitian. So having, you know, a decent science foundation, I mean, if you completely can't pass your science classes, then that's an important part of being a dietitian. And of course, like once you're in your DPD program, like you're doing what you're passionate about, I'm expecting that you have good grades. And I mentioned American history because I don't like, like American history was never my thing. Like I remember I definitely got like a C in that class. I didn't enjoy it. It didn't motivate me. I wasn't engaged in it. Right. But if you're in your DPD courses, I'm expecting you to like give it your all, whatever that happens to mean that these are classes that you want to take and that you're engaged in. So I'm definitely looking at DPD courses, everything on that course list that will be supplied, prereqs, DPD courses, that is the only GPA I'm looking at because that's honestly what I think it's going to contribute to you be, to them being a dietitian. No, that's awesome. It's, it's a pretty weird spin on things. No, it's, it's refreshing because the students who are career changers, they got a previous bachelor's in something really random and they suffered through it and they didn't really do that well. They come back and they do really, really well as a DPD student, but they always have that cumulative like, hanging on them and they always feel that they're not good enough for certain programs that put a lot of emphasis on cumulative, but they're like, yeah, but my DPD GPA is really, really high, but they're afraid that they won't even get their foot in the door or get their application even looked at because of that cumulative. So it's nice that you you give students that opportunity to kind of be like, that was that, but this is what I have to offer. It's really nice. I I just remember being like a freshman, like at, I mean, even it's it's interesting because in high school I had a 4.0. But I grew up in a really low socioeconomic area where nobody went to college. And I'm like, I'm going to college. So I went to a community college. I'm working full time. I'm taking night classes. And I remember I'm so exhausted. I'm like falling asleep. I had a night class that was, you know, college algebra from 5 to 10 o'clock at night. And I just remember like falling asleep. Like I just remember like it was such a hard adjustment and so my first year in college, I didn't get great grades. It's not like I wasn't smart. I had a 4.0 previously. I had all AP classes, but there was an adjustment there. And so as I'm really looking for people, I'm looking for their potential to be a dietitian. And things that happened years ago or where you got up on the wrong foot, I just doesn't don't think that that impacts somebody's potential to be a dietitian. Yeah, to- I totally agree. So you had mentioned you take up to 66 uh, interns, how many applications on average do y'all look through every year? And I'll tell you, to be honest, most years we take 60. And that's largely because we want to have a really nice, like, faculty student ratio. Mm-hmm. And so typically, like this year, I think Nikki and Maria, my other two faculty members, they have 23 students that report to them. You know, 22 students that report to them each. And I have 16 students that report to me because we want to make sure that we have good connections with all of our interns and we know them and we're really, really close with them this whole, through this whole process. Application numbers, um, like in the past few years, we've been really lucky that our applications haven't dropped significantly where a lot of other programs have. They've definitely dropped off from maybe where we were five years ago. So five years ago, we were, we had like 150 applications every year. But in the past couple of years, I say we've had more about like 
15. So on average, I would say that our match rate is about 50%. Okay. Which is pretty, which is pretty good odds. Yeah. So I always recommend to people, whether it's my program or another program, apply to a program that has like more spots, whatever that happens to look like, because the match rates are typically higher. Mm-hmm. If you apply to some place that has three spots, typically the match rates are really, really low. And you could get one of those spots, but you also might not. That is true. That is true. And you mentioned how the due date for Dicus this year is on a Monday. It also falls in what we have here, Mardi Gras. The students do have school. They don't have school (laughs) that Monday, so they have no excuse to get their stuff in on time uh, or get it in early before whatever Mardi Gras ends up looking like this year before they go and do that. As you were talking, I was peeking at my calendar and I was like, Oh, Mardi Gras break. That's, I got to talk to them about that. Well, and the other thing is too, just I've had people, I've had applicants who've had dicus glitches mm-hmm. and I don't, and it wasn't last year, but it was, was it last year or the year before where dicus closed an hour early by mistake last, last year. year, right? So dicus is a little funny sometimes. So I definitely, I'm like the anti procrastinator. I'm always like, let's get it done early mm-hmm. because you just never know what's going to happen. And just Dicus is a little crazy sometimes. They always tweak it just a little bit more every year, but then something different happens. So it's exactly they fix that problem and another little thing happens. (laughs) Well, that is all the questions that I had for you today. Thank you so much for joining me. This was an awesome conversation. I I just add one more thing. There's just one more thing. I just, I meant to put this on my slides and then I didn't. Yeah. Um, So this is also just my opinion perspective. You know, a lot of people are kind of considering right now, like, should I do a DI or should I do an MSDI? So this is, so we have like a completion, like an online completion, like master's degree, but we haven't integrated yet. And so some people ask me, well, why haven't you just combined that? Why can't I just do them both at the same time? My perspective is get your RD, get in, get an internship, get your RD, and start working as a dietitian and increase your earning potential. The sooner you come become a health professional, the higher your earning potential is going to be. Then, like, for example, for our master's degree, our master's in dietetics administration, that degree is made for working dietitians. Everything we do, we integrate into your workplace as a working dietitian. But I try to tell people, don't, like, prolong that RD credential. If you can say, I've been an RD for five years versus three years, um, that looks really good on your resume as well. So right now I'm definitely encouraging people, get in, get the credential. You never know what's going to happen. You might have like thinking, okay, I'm going to do an MSDI and then, then something happens, happens, life happens. Who knew that we were going to be in the middle of a pandemic? We would have never imagined this would ever happen in our lives, but it is happening. So get in, get your credential that I'm in 100% full support of a master's degree, then get your master's degree. I support increasing education. Um, you know, I think that that's an important thing for RDs, but get in, get working. You will always have that RD credential to fall back on. You can always get an RD job and then get a master's degree in the future. That's just my perspective um, because I want people to increase that earning potential. And is it still set for your, the completion program? You just have to pass the RD exam and then you can continue on. And complete. Yes, that's pretty much it. Like there's, you have to apply to the graduate school, but ultimately Unless there's, like, some major issue that happened in the dietetic internship, like, we accept people into this, into the MDA. And the MDA can be completed in one year. It's only an additional 18 credit units. And, again, there's no out-of-state tuition. Everybody pays the exact same tuition. And the tuition is fairly low. If you look at other, like, online programs out there, these schools are, like, they're making tuition incredibly high. So I think like right now, I think the completion is, I can tell you, so it's 18 credit units and it's like, it's less than $10,000 to finish your master's degree. Yeah, that's Where, <laughs> when you look at other online programs, like they're like, we offer this online so-and-so, it's like $40,000. And I definitely wouldn't recommend that because then you're just like, you're going to be in the hole and then it's going to be hard to get out of that. So I think that tuition is a really important thing to look at. Our, our internship tuition is a little bit higher, but I 
by like maybe a thousand dollars in some other distance programs. But I feel like we, we're, we're worth the investment because we give so many resources to our students. And then we have this completion degree, which is, you know, fairly low. If people want to do another degree, that's fine too. But um, get in there and get your RD and get that job. So you can start earning those wages instead of like earning like lower wages as you've been doing like some other points in time in your college career. Yeah, especially since you'll have that, the school food service aspect that really does set students up for those higher paying jobs. Because I get asked that a lot, like, what are the good paying jobs? And it's like, well, unless you go into like administration and higher education, which takes a long time, long time to get there. I was like school food service. And I get the, and it's like, it's not what you think it is. You're not stuck in a kitchen for the rest of your life. Like there's way more to it. And you described it so well when you're talking about all the things that they would be doing. So And it's so impactful. Like, I mean, people like want to make an impact on the younger generation and and this is how to do it. It's one of the ways you can do it. And yes, there's a lot of management aspects and you're managing like people. Um, And, you know, with that comes some difficulties as well, managing people, managing programs, management jobs, like they're just a little bit different and they're a little bit more administrative and you spend a little bit more time at a desk, Mm -hmm. but you do feel have a huge impact still. I feel like like new dietitians think that they can only make an impact on patients. And that's absolutely not true. Like all dietitians make huge impacts in various areas of our community. Um, and just some pay better than others. Exactly. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you again for joining me today. And for those at home, if you're interested in getting more information about the program at Utah State University and to get in touch with Dr. Peterson, check out the link to their website put in the description at the bottom of this video. And as always, don't forget to like this video, subscribe to my page so you never miss another spotlight session. And there are plenty of other spotlight sessions to check out while you're here. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye, everyone.